I'm still getting used to my cane. Uh, life, <laughs> life changes in 10 years. So 10 years ago, I was uh, playing basketball three times a week in the morning at 6 o'clock. And uh, on the off days, on Tuesday and Thursday, I was playing tennis. So life changes, and so adaption is quite important. How do we become flexible? I guess in some ways it's true that what we're experiencing in uh, today's uh, world is very different from, from what has been, even over the last few years. Um, I'm pleased to be here at Trinity heard much about it. I'm a graduate of Lexington Christian Academy in Lexington, Massachusetts, not Kentucky, uh, and uh, was on the board for quite some time there, uh, as well as uh, with song time. Uh, John DeBrine, knew John DeBrine when he was pastoring Ruggel Street Baptist Church and was doing his radio program from the basement of the church. Uh, which we were at. So I'm familiar with both because I believe the person who was instrumental in Trinity was also involved at Lexington Christian Academy uh, in its beginning. So it's uh, good to be here. Uh, just look at the slide for a second. Just think about people have adolescence. Yeah. You're all being challenged well. <laughs> okay. Um, just a few ideas. Do we have anything to eat? Uh, that's typical adolescent. Raid the fridge. I uh, want to go to Susie's house after school. Who's going to be there? Can I talk with the parents? What's that about? Uh, do I have to take out the trash this morning? Uh, fascinating thought, how we are able to provide some kind of responsibility to adolescents. Uh, that's tough. No, I'm not coming to church with this morning. It's too boring. Uh, no kids, no interaction, no one there. I have a soccer, volleyball. As you know, today, sports is becoming much more Sunday morning events, which is becoming very difficult about how you coordinate that. Which is more a priority? Is it church or is it the sport? 45 more days until I go for my driver's license permit. Some parents are very happy about that. Because now I don't have to drive you anymore. That's great. Uh, Bobby is taking me to the prom. Can he take me home at midnight? Maybe stretching it a couple of hours, but we'll see. What's with this hair on my body? Uh, particularly as they go from 12 to whatever. Oh no, does this mean I become a woman? Or in today's politically correct language, uh, does that mean I'm becoming a she? And then they say, no, I want to be a he. And that's becoming very, very popular these days, particularly with my, what Michael King was talking about in terms of the curriculum that's there. Uh, I have a five-year-old granddaughter who approached my wife back a few months ago, she's in public school kindergarten, and she came up to my wife and said, do you feel to be a boy or a girl today? Starting that young, talking about gender issues, changes, openness, that you can think or feel even whatever you want to be at the moment. That's what's being taught. Uh, leave me alone. I don't want to talk. We had a beautiful presentation this morning about communication and the benefits of communication. And sometimes you think, I have to communicate with my teenager. And yet, they are so withdrawn, quiet, they won't let you in. Have you ever experienced that with your kids, with teenager? They don't come out and say, hey, I want to talk to you. But they hear. They do hear, that's for sure. They do hear. But it's important to be able to have the dialogue that's there. That, that's the critical piece. 
No one likes me at school. The kids are always making fun of me. I don't want to go anymore. You don't understand me. Many times that's true for adolescents. They feel that they're not understood. And you know, when I turn 18, I can make my own decisions. That's what life is all about. And if they're not in a Christian setting, being taught the realities of what is there different from what they experience in public school particularly, they have a sense that there's no longer any more boundary of authority. And we have to be careful when we use the word authority because it's not control authority, it's respected authority. It's how do we respect those who are there? How do we respect our parents, which are the critical aspect for all teaching to adolescents? Okay. Um, when I work with people, this is particularly how I see a person. And I just wanted to give you a sense of this. At the very, if we were to do is all concentric circles, the very core of that would be spiritual. That's the main core of all of individuals as we are as people, regardless of whether we are redeemed or not. The spiritual core is still there. The disconnection has occurred, but we still have that spiritual desire in need. Then the relationships around that, acquaintances, friends, and relatives, those are the people who begin to influence. We have emotions, we have our body, particularly physiology, uh, and our full body being. We have our cognition. We have the culture around us. What does one of the scriptures say? Be in this world and be not what? Conformed. Or as the newer translations go, squeezed into their mold. And then the environment as a whole. All of these aspects affect the individual and they have to be thought of when we're talking about adolescence. What are the variables that are pushing, pushing our kids to think the way they are, to have what they are? Now, if they're in a Christian school, they are somewhat more directed to think differently about life. But if they're not in a Christian school, the impact, the impact of what the influences will be, particularly of relationships, of their intellectual input, cultural issues, and also the environment that we live in. All of those are critical aspects of how they get changed in their life. Next slide. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of all these labels, Gen X, Millennials, Gen Z, basically we're now talking about Gen Z in the adolescent. Next. You can find out where you are in that category. Now, COVID-19 and beyond shaping the next generation, adolescents who represent the younger side of Gen Z uh, were robbed of the capstone of their formative years, uh, particularly when they were so isolated for two years. And then online learning, away from their friends, not being able to interact, or interact only via media, either on uh, the internet, by Facebook, TikTok, whatever it is that they use. And uh, it creates a great deal of isolation. And we'll see what this isolation has done to some of the adolescents that have occurred uh, as we go forward. They watched uh, police violence, racial tensions, we all did this, uh, they saw angry mobs taking over cities, wildfires, natural disasters. Throughout the pandemic, physical health needs of the most vulnerable often took prior priority over the mental health needs of others. We were very concerned about the physical status of individuals, particularly elderly. What is happening with them? What are they doing? What is going on with them? Are they are they able to be safe? And we have a number of instances where COVID took over a lot of the ages. Um, 
But as the pandemic dragged on, healthcare providers began to focus on long-term effects on youth and teens. In 2020, suicide rates for all ages dropped by 5.6%. Uh, that's usually noted in psychological terms as pulling together. Whenever there is a crisis, people tend to pull together. They come and support each other. Uh, where suicide rates tend to dip during the shared experience. But late March 2020, trips to the ER for anything other than COVID-19 plummeted by 42% across all ages, while the non-COVID trips to the ER declined. Trips for psychosocial issues actually increased by 69%. Children and teens experienced increases of about 24 and 31 percent, respectively. Troubling indications that suicide-related ER visits by girls were significantly higher than those by boys. In the summer of 2020, visits for attempted suicide rose 26 percent among girls age 12 to 17, compared with the year before that. Because of the isolation, because of the difficulty of being housed in, I'm not saying the parents had anything to do with this, but it's, uh, it's, one, of the, it's one of the issues that are there, that they, when you're closed in, it creates more problems for the psychosocial aspect. Okay, next. I wanted to just show, uh, I don't want to take all the time with this, but just to show the different stages uh, and also the impact of early adolescence all the way to late adolescence with some age breakdown. So you can begin to understand what it is that's going on for an adolescent. Uh, for physical growth, for example, in early adolescence, you have puberty, rapid uh, growth, you get taller, bigger, more muscular. Uh, sexual characteristics uh, begin to appear. Uh, and then in middle adolescence, uh, secondary sexual characteristics further develop. And 95% of adult height is reached usually between 14 and 15 years old. Now, we will have other things that occur where, that are outside of that. For example, we've had uh, uh, boys who have, who have grown even into when they were in university, when they were getting taller. Uh, in late adolescence, physical maturity, reproductive growth, leveling off and ending. Now, intellectual cognition is important, particularly as we have been talking about this morning, about how we talk communicating with adolescents or children. How do we deal with the issues at hand? It's important to know what their intellectual capacity is in that moment. Because if we don't understand it, we're not going to be able to get through to what we're trying to communicate because they're not there at that level of understanding. So, for example, at ages 11 to 13, concrete thought dominates. And that is, they are thinking only about the here and now. That's all they have. Here and now is what they're thinking about. Cause and effect relationships are underdeveloped. They don't understand what it is if they do something and what that impact is to another. And stronger self than social awareness. That's why it's difficult to have an early adolescent understand the impact that their event or their behavior has on someone else is very difficult to get through because they have more of a sense of self than social awareness. We heard this morning how teaching some of the Christian principles can change some of that self-reference view, which is very important as we go through. Now, for the 14 to 15, growth is in, in abstract thought, reverts to concrete. When they're under stress, they revert back. Now, that's true for us as adults, isn't it? When we're stressed, sometimes we revert back to older behaviors that upsets us. Or we revert back for those of us who are very old, such as myself, 
we revert back to parent behavior. We say, I never want to be like that. And all of a sudden, you see yourself saying and doing the same thing your parent did. And it's very upsetting because you see that our normal nature is to pull us back there. Cause and effect relationships are better understood in those middle adolescent years, and they're highly self-absorbed. Now, how would we know about that? They certainly are, aren't they, huh? Um, now, in terms of the later adolescent, abstract, abstract thought is completely established. Now, let me just give you a little example. Uh, in one of the tests that I do, I'm also, I also do neuropsych testing, in one of the tests that are there, there's a question that says, this very particular point, in what way is a table and chair alike? I don't want anyone to blur out any answers. But you think about that. One answer could be, a table and chair have four legs. Right? What could be another potential answer? You sit on the chair and you use the table to either write on, eat from, or that kind of behavior. Or you can go to the third level, which is in what way are a table and chair alike? An all inclusive label, which would be furniture. So each level that I've described is a different level of thought. The first one, the four legs, is concrete thinking. The one that talks about sitting on the chair and eating or using the table for working on is functional. Your thought pattern at that point is thinking about how you use things, functionality. The third aspect is a collection of seemingly different objects that have un unifying elements, which is furniture. That is abstract thinking. That's where the person is able to then bring it to the next level. When we talk about scriptures with adolescents, we're talking not only about functionality, but we're also talking about abstract thought. Because when you tell an adolescent Christ died for your sins. How does he understand that? Does he understand it functionally, concretely? Or does he understand the abstract level of what that means that Christ is now able to be a part of my life if I confess of my sin? And that's the level that one thinks about when we're dealing with adolescents is you want them to get to that abstract level thought of how they're able to understand and bring in their salvation for good use. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm taking too much time here. Uh, autonomy, this is what they do. Challenge the authority of family structure that's early on in adolescence. They tend to be more lonely, withheld, more isolated. They have wide mood swings, how well we know that. Begins to reject childhood likings. And they're argumentative and disobedient. Again, I'm not here to present interventional ways. I'm only, just, I'm only setting it out. That's why the other, other presentations have done that very well. The middle adolescents, conflict with family predominates due to ambivalence about emerging independence. That was sort of the question. I'm not going to church anymore. Have any of you had that experience with an adolescent? Said, I'm not going to church anymore? And how do you deal with that? Well, okay, we'll let you stay home and we'll go. Is that really dealing with it? That, I don't believe, is a good answer. Uh, middle adolescence, con oh, I already said that, ambivalence about going. And then late adolescence, the emancipation. That is finally going off to work and adult life. Unfortunately, this particular graph didn't take into account 2022 or 2018 or 2000 or 2000. Because today, adolescence is extended almost out to age 30. 
It's true, very true. Because of the difficulties of what I talked about in how we see people, the environment, the culture, does not allow the child to grow, the adolescent to grow to the point where they need to be. Because how many 28, 29 year olds are still living with their parents? Now, is it because they want to? Sometimes, no, because they're financially not able to do much more than that. They're not able to get traction to get beyond it. My age, if you weren't married at 21 and have a job at 21 and established your, your residence at 21, you were a failure. But today, that's not the case. And so there's a lot of understanding and adaptation that takes place that people, adolescents particularly, have a longer run of what they have to deal with. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one quick. Uh, body image, early adolescents, they're preoccupied with physical changes, anxiety about secondary sexual characteristics, and peers are idealized as a standard for normal appearance. How many times have you ever seen that? They, they're sort of like a clan. They all dress alike, they all look alike, they're all doing things alike. But then by middle adolescence, you see some of that changing. There's less concern about physical changes. There's increased interest in personal attractiveness. I've got to be better by, I've got to look better than so-and-so who happened to be a friend in the group, but I want to look better than that person. Excessive physical activity alternating with lethargy. And you've seen that. Very active, and then they sleep forever, right? Saturday mornings and never want to wake up. That's it. Or they sleep when they come home. Uh, late adolescents, usually comfortable with body image at that point, and they're moving on. Next. Uh, peer group. In the early adolescent, intense friendships with the same sex, all, all hanging out together. Then there's contact with opposite sex in groups. You see them all hanging out in groups, boys, girls, that sort of thing. Then in middle adolescence, you have a strong peer allegiance. They have fad as behaviors are all different and different kind of clothing and different things that they want. And then sexual drives emerge and adolescents begin to explore ability to date and attract a partner, uh, which is the scary phase of that life. And then later adolescents, decisions, values, are less influenced by the peers, they're beginning to establish their own thought. This is where this morning's discussion was very important because if you're able to walk through these steps with the adolescent and get to the later years, 18, 20, 22, their values and decisions have now been put into place and it's less effective from the peers but it's more internalized by themselves. And they want to be able to do that as an individual person. That's, that's their preference of where they, they want to be. All right, next. Uh, identity development. Sorry I'm carrying on a class here of human development. I'm sorry, the aspect. But I thought it was important for us to understand the nuances of how we're dealing with adolescence. In the peer group, early at, uh, identity development, I'm sorry. Got the wrong page here. Uh, early adolescence, the questions are usually, am I normal? Daydreaming, students sitting in a classroom looking out the window, teachers trying to figure out where they are. Johnny, are you with us? Um, those are the important things there to kind of bring them back. Vocational goals change frequently. I'm gonna be this, I'm gonna be that. Begin to develop their own value system emerging sexual feelings, imagery, Im imaginary audience, in other words, they're performing. They're, they're having to do things that they think about people who are out there who are praising them. Desire for privacy, and they magnify their own problem, uh, which you already have understood that. If you have adolescents who are that age, you know. Everything is absolutely magnified to the hilt. And when you get to sit down and you listen to what they're actually struggling with and you see the importance of what they're trying to say, it's critically important to be able to do that because you realize that the emotion has overtaken the thought process of where they are. 
Uh, middle experimentation, tough, tough years, sex, drug, friends, risk-taking behavior, and then later adolescents pursue realistic vocational goals, one hopes, relates to family as an adult, one hopes, begins to distinguish their imagination from real, and establish sexual identity and activity. This is the part that really gets extended way out, is this last phase that moves into the later, later 20s. All right, next, social behavior uh, issues, uh, ba basically in late adolescence, searching for identity by gender, peer group, cultural groups, and all, seeking more independence. Now, what's interesting is there's very little talk about faith development. How do we know how faith is being developed for the adolescent? What, it, what, it, what is going on there? Now, I've indicated a little bit, glimpses here and there about their cognitive thinking, but there was a fellow, James Fowler, at Emory University, who developed what it was called stages of faith. Um, a very intriguing book. Uh, he is now the late uh, James Fowler, passed away in 2015. But he sees the ages 12 to adult and didn't differentiate those stages within adolescence to adult. But he says that it's basically the identification with a religious institution, belief system, or authority that the growth of a person's re personal religious or spiritual identity is placed. Again, that's why the church is very significant in the adolescent life. Activities to bring them in, to connect with the church, to see the facility, even though we don't want to make a big thing of the facility, but for kids, adolescents who are in this struggle, they can identify, this is the place I go to. This is the place that teaches me. They may not have the full understanding or comprehension of their spiritual aspect to it, but they know relationships are important. And as they continue down that path, the relationship is what builds the faith story for them. It's all through relationships. That's how faith stories are built. Uh, okay, go to the next, and we'll move along here. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about social media, uh, which is another huge challenge for us. This was a, an interview done with Dr. Alan Blotsky, clinical and forensic psychology. He's Jewish, uh, as all psychologists and psychiatrists usually are. I'm out of the norm, although I must admit I had my own analysis that I had to do when I was in training at Mass General uh, to be able to go through four years of analysis with a Jewish analyst. Um, but intriguing, I'll just give, share this story with you. I was dealing with a problem, and he was aware of the fact that, I, that we had converted, our family had converted from Catholicism to Protestant. And, uh, he had a very fascinating background in that his family was taken out of Germany as, as a Jewish family by the underground to Italy. So there was a, good, there was a good connection there. And I was dealing with something, and he said to me out of the clear blue, Jim, what does this have to do with your faith? And it startled me. And I said, wait a second, you're not supposed to be asking me questions about faith. That's not part of the deal. But see, in his wisdom, he knew that the core base of me had a religious base. And he wanted to tap back to what that really was in what I was dealing with. Marvelous. That's how Karis came to be, actually, 40 years ago. It was out of that personal experience, realizing that the integration of faith and psychology is possible. It's there. You can do it. It's not contrary to its element. It does go hand in hand. At any rate, TikTok. Uh, very, very disturbing. Uh, and he is very much concerned about TikTok. This was an article uh, interview that was done last year 
in psychology today. And uh, his concern is, is that TikTok recommends videos focusing on suicidal ideation, showing clips that demonstrate suicide or glorify suicidal behavior. I mean, it's amazing to stop and think that there would actually be someone who would show how to do this. And they actually have support groups that you can connect in and talk with in order to do it. Grappling with an eating disorder. Some of our, some of our adolescents have eating disorders, either be bulimia or anorexia, two of a devastating, devastating eating disorders. And they're showing video clips of self-induced vomiting or strict diets. I mean, it's, it's amazing that this would be taking place. Depression may be confronted with dismissive or sarcastic comments from others. Not believed. People would not be believed that they are feeling this way. Bullying to dangerous challenges. How many of you remember the laundry soap cubes that, that kids were swallowing? How many could they do uh, in one time? Absolutely destroyed their lives, destroyed their gut, killed themselves as a result of doing this. It was a big challenge. It's crazy. TikTok is also harmful to both girls, I say her, and boys, them, trying to be in, the, in today's now. Uh, but it is harmful to both, not just girls. Boys are also affected by TikTok. What are the effects of TikTok? Study shows that users take approximately an hour and seven minutes to fall asleep at night if they're using TikTok. After using this app, it takes an hour and seven minutes to fall asleep. If, if you're adolescent is looking at TikTok before they go to sleep, it'll take them an hour to go to sleep. Additionally, adolescents at this point spend only 14% of their sleep cycle in REM. That's the dream cycle. You go alpha, beta, REM. REM is the sleep cycle that is very important to be completed in that sleep cycle. If you have interrupted sleep, and I'm sure a lot of you at times have had interrupted sleep, you get up in the middle of the night, don't know what you want to do with yourself, you get up, you read, you do, or whatever. Interrupted sleep is harmful to one's health. Very critical. There's also the hashtag pain talk, which talks about suicide and self-harm. These are conversational items that adolescents are being dealt with. Now, let me give you a positive with this last slide. Since all that I've talked about is sort of very damning and, and very down, it's like, my Lord, what are we doing here? <laughs> but look at this. What came out of one of the most liberal schools around, my alma mater, believe it or not, and it says, research from the Chan School of Public Health, co-authored by Ying Chen, suggests that a religious upbringing can profine, profoundly help adolescents navigate the challenges of these years. Isn't that uplifting? They also found that a religious upbringing contributes to a wide range of health and well-being outcomes later in life. Now, Kohlberg, who was at Harvard back in the 70s and 80s, unfortunately passed away uh, by taking his own life in the Boston Harbor. But he was a moral development teacher. For example, his biggest push was to teach students moral values. Now, again, he was Jewish, but he had a Jewish religious background, which is familiar to our Judeo-Christian background. And his big, big push was to teach high schoolers moral development. And in his writings, he said, the fourth stage of moral development is when a person can sacrifice their own life for someone else. What did Christ do for us? 
sacrificed his life for us. And he mentioned Christ in his writing. It's amaz amazing how that was very useful. Um, okay, so their study was 5,000 adolescents, and this is what they uh, found. Uh, that it was helping to protect the big three dangers of adolescence, depression, suicide, and um, uh, body, body image issues. Uh, those who attended religious services regularly were 12% less likely to have high depressive symptoms. 33% less likely to use illicit drugs. Those who prayed or made, meditated frequently were 30% less likely to start having sex at a young age. 40% less likely to subsequently have a sexual transmitted infection. Next. A religious upbringing contributed toward a number of positive outcomes of much greater happiness, more volunteering in the community, and we heard that about focusing toward others, not toward ourselves this morning. A greater sense of mission and purpose and higher levels of forgiveness. For example, those who attend religious, religious services subsequently, 18% were more likely to report high levels of happiness, 87% more likely to have high levels of forgiveness, which is something we're always pushing for, right, in our world? And a religious upbringing also contributed toward a number of positive outcomes as well as greater happiness. Those who prayed frequently, 38% more likely to volunteer in their community, other-oriented, 47% more likely to have a high sense of mission and purpose. An amazing, an amazing study. Who would have thought this would have come out of Harvard? But it did, and very significant because the School of Public Health has significant influence. And this is what we're trying to attempt, to be able to show that our religious core, if you go back to the original slide, the, the core of us as individuals is spiritual. That's where it all begins. And that's where we have to continually be reminded of who we are working with our adolescents.